I'd like to do actually is I believe I'm going to talk about perhaps four things that we don't talk about very often and that frankly might actually be uh, new for our thinking here. So that's part of the goal here. Uh, but I'd like to make this a dialogue, a discussion that we have in which we share ideas. And I'm reminded of a proverb or Chinese proverb that I heard just last week. And it goes something like this. If you and I have an apple and we exchange apples, we each end up with one apple. If you and I have an idea and we exchange ideas, we each end up with two ideas. And it's kind of that spirit here. I want to provoke and prompt some discussion here about something that I think uh, is very important, some considerations about cropping systems and ways to improve what we're doing that we might not always give uh, top priority to in our thinking, I, I think. Uh, and uh, so that's one goal that I have. The second thing is that I was a, co a colleague of mine, mine recently, in the last several months anyway, made the observation that Part of the reason, this is a criticism of our UC system right here now that I'm going to share candidly with you, that way back in the 80s when the organic stuff started going and getting momentum and attention and everything, uh, the university didn't really have a lot, it could be argued anyway, that, that we've contributed to that whole, that whole initiative and that organic program there. And, Part of the reason, according to this one colleague, was that people didn't get along. People within the system couldn't, couldn't come to the agreement about putting down egos and these kinds of things. And as a result, things just didn't happen. I use that as an example, and maybe that's a bit too candid on my part uh, in a public setting, just to make the point that there are things that are contentious. There are things that we don't agree with that we all have diverse opinions about and perspectives about. And one of those things, I believe, probably in this day and age, is soil health. You've all gotten bombarded by this in the press and in the farm publications and that kind of stuff. It's out there. It's big time out there. And I'd like to have a dialogue today about that and, and add some of our own experience and some of the principles to that. But I want to make this engaging. So that's where I want to go. There will be three parts. I want to share some, some general observations that I have. We're going to do a little bit of a show and tell from some soils that we've been working with for about 19 years now. And this leads into what Gary and Marie are doing here at, at their farm here uh, to try to look at some of the, the challenges that, that uh, Dan just mentioned. And then I want to have an activity where we can talk about this together. So the first thing I want to do is, there's a guy, and I don't know if any, has anybody ever read this book by Edward Faulkner? It was published in 1942. And it's, it, it, and he, this guy was a farm advisor, all right? He was just like the three of us here from the university. And it is said that this book, it was called Plowman's Folly by Edward Faulkner, has been the 11th most cited publication of all time in, in terms of soil, soil science or soil topics. And it's only a few spots behind Charles Darwin in terms of citing references about somebody's work being important to look at. The reason this book and this you know, farm advisor from back east got this attention is because he challenged the way we think about what we're doing. And his, his statement is right here. The truth is that no one has ever advanced a scientific reason for plowing. So that's right out in your face, folks. All right, he's, he's saying, all right, why are we doing this kind of disturbance? Why are we doing the kind of land preparation year after year, crop after crop, we're doing. All right? So that's the kind of thing. They didn't engender this huge national debate. I mean, this riled people when this was going on in the 40s. It was big news, all right? USDA was involved in trying to buffer, you know, the, the, the right information getting out. Our people were arguing. There were journalists involved in this kind of stuff. And it was a big problem. All right, there's, there's another thing I want to set up just to sort of create this, 
the setting or the stage and what your appetites for debate in a few minutes here, I hope, is that, that somebody who was writing sort of like a sociological study about that incident, Plowman's Folly, in the history of American farming, pointed out that agriculture has not had enough heresy. I don't know if you'll agree with that, but that was a statement that looked back at the value that this debate engendered in the way we look at how we talk. All right, and I, I'm coming at you a little bit in this heretical perspective here and in trying to get some discussion going on because I think, you know, I was asked by uh, Marcia to talk about soil health. It is contentious. There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of stuff that we want to maybe air out and talk about. But I think it's not a, probably a bad thing. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at here. Now, let me, let me just, and I don't want to only rely on this, but I want to sort of tell a story right now. A few years ago, I was, uh, a long time ago, I was, in, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana, in southern Central Africa. And I didn't get to go back to Africa for a number of years, but a few years later I did. And I was in Kenya, and I was asked to help with some other people on a water efficiency irrigation effort there. In, in, in a very dry area there. In Kenya, people were literally starving. They, were, they had famine. It was much unlike Botswana, where people, I never saw starvation and people you know, really acutely hungry. But in Kenya, that was the case there. So it was a very, very dire situation there. There was an extension person, a Kenyan himself, and they were kind enough to have simultaneous in, you know, translation for everything that was being said by the Kenyans and the people like me there. So I could follow what he was saying. He was, he was very gifted as a communicator. He was challenging the farmers who were in the audience by saying, look at these people. They've come all the way from America to show us how to do farming and everything. Why aren't you doing a better job in your, in your farm field? I said, oh my goodness, this is really bad. I mean, this, is, this guy's coming up way too harsh. This is mean, all right? This is ugly, con confrontational in your face kind of stuff. But, and then I was thinking to myself, the reason, and here's where I'm going to be confrontational with you all, okay? The reason there's such good levels of productivity, because we have water. We have developed your water for irrigation. We have had it. That masks a lot of other problems that cropping systems production, food production systems have. We have the luxury of developed water through this Central Valley water projects. Point statement, period. I believe that that's enabled people to mask a lot of other problems that happen in their systems. And we might argue about that, but I think that's a small thing. I mean, that's a very big, important thing. We also do, uh, or the farmers that are doing this in the front line, they have done lots of probably annual, at least associated with each crop, means of preparing in annual crops, the seed beds, the preparations to get a crop, to get a, a crop stand and to grow a crop there. Tillage is another thing that masks problems. We can overcome lots of problems if we have water, which we have had, and if we do a lot of tillage. So I'm saying this because I think those two big items, irrigation water availability and tillage, have masked a lot of problems that exist in the soil. All right, we'll come back to that a little bit here in a minute. One of the things that I think is important, and I just want to throw this out for all of you here because we have an opportunity now to talk about soil health in a public arena like this today, is that you all should probably, you know, you need to weigh in on this thing. All right, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the USDA and through the NRCS has this big national program on soil health. It's not a program, it's an initiative. They value it so much that they're putting this term initiative because they want to see things happen. They want to move the needle, as they say. CDFA has a big pro program on soil health. Right? There's government taxpayer money being dedicated to these efforts here. And my point on this is farmers guide, guiding research for soil health. I think we need, or you need, to, to weigh in on this with your own perspectives, your ideas, your priorities, your needs. And, and, and have that registered. So that's something I'm, I'm making as a, as a personal kind of a plea here. Now, if you look at just the general stuff, and this boils down to things that you all would agree with, what, what, do you, what constitutes good soil management? All right, how do you do practices to improve and care for your soil? 
Well, all right, this is the USDA NRCS list. And I, I, I almost hate to say that, you know, they have sort of captured this list from other people's work over the decades and everything, but it's not a bad list, all right? Reduce disturbance, have diversity, keep roots growing, all right, organic matter in there, and keep the soil covered. Not a bad list, all right? There, there are fundamental scientific principles underlying each of those things that I think we can all probably agree with in some reason. My own mentor, who is kind of an in-your-face kind of a guy back in South Dakota, Dwayne Beck, says, you know, it's this kind of a list here. It's emulating natural systems, how Mother Nature functions. And again, you can see some of the same kinds of things that could be argued should be done in farmland, in agroecosystems. The bottom one is that Mother Nature doesn't do tillage, reduce disturbance, right? So that, that theme that Dan introduced there earlier is, is important to me. All right, I think that uh, some of the things, let me, let me see if I can do this so that everyone can see this. Gary and Maria, in fact, let me show this first of all, our part, and Jeff is part of this thing, and then I forgot your name. Right. They're, they're student workers out of UC Davis there, and they're, they're working with Dan Monk and me and Gary and Marie here to try to test whether this man, this, if you can change things to have a positive impact on soil, on soil function, all right? And so what Gary and Marie are doing here, they're gonna evaluate in these three 25 or so acre fields over here, the benefits or not of adding a winter cover crop to address some of the soil infiltration problems that, that they, they are concerned to work on. This thing about cover crop, you know, talk about adding roots to the soil, keeping the soil covered and everything, this is not a new thing. I don't know if some of you remember, just this spring in the Fresno Bee, May 2013 here, I, this article caught my eye. Uh, and it says, you know, the, this is in Madera County, cotton, People are interesting cover crop tests in operation at Hayes Ranch. This article, the woman who wrote the article about the, the Madeira cotton uh, event, cited this article from way back 1930 in Fresno Bee with people doing cover crops. So this is not new stuff. This is not reinventing new scientific information. This is coming back to basic principles of, of trying to address those goals over here. So that, that's all there. So I'm going to be, sort of show you what we have up here right now, where we've actually taken this seriously, all right? We have stubbornly, since 1999, just 30 miles southwest or east of here in Five Points, we have an eight-acre field, all right? We've been doing no disturbance for 19 years, adding cover crops for 19 years, and largely only on winter irrigation. We irrigated in the first year, we put on four inches and then we irrigated. But then after that, we said, well, hey, nobody's gonna grow cover crops with water. They're not gonna irrigate the cover. So we didn't do any irrigation. Right? We didn't, we, and except the last few years, because we come back around to thinking that we, eval we value cover crops as an input into the system there. So we're, we're putting money on the, the irrigation of cover crops there. But you got, this is tomatoes in the old days. We're now doing other crops. This was cotton early on for about 12 years. Harvest the tomatoes, harvest the cotton, shred the cotton, get a waiver on the pink bollworm uh, requirement to undercut and do all the tillage there. But then we plant the next year's crop. Tomatoes go into cotton, and cotton goes no-till into tomatoes. So that's the hardcore system we've been working on. How do you, right? how do you kill the cotton? How do we kill the cotton? Yeah, how do we shredded this. This has been shredded. But it doesn't stub back. No, but then we, we do do, we, we are in compliance, so we come through with just a, an undercutter kind of an event, or a root puller. We, do, we don't do, we're not consistent on that, but we, we, the thing we do, we shred, we undercut, but we don't mix, okay? That's the third part we haven't been doing technically legally, all right? And the, 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 far, the <coughs> commissioner knows about that, and they watched very carefully what was happening with, with insects there. But I, I, then we add cover crop, so we have four systems. No-till without a cover crop, no-till with a cover crop, standard tillage where you're doing the normal disking and ripping and uh, bed prep and everything with and without cover crops. All right, so that's what we've been doing for a long year, and I'll, a, a number of years, and I'll show you what's happening. It's, it's not, there's been learning, all right? The first few years we failed. Probably the first three years in cotton, couldn't get a good stand. We didn't know how to do the planting. 
Uh, and that's just a technical thing. We had to learn that. After the, probably those three years, we have had zero difference in yield between standard till and no-till cotton. All right? That's not only cotton, that's also uh, corn, that's also garbanzos, that's also wheat, and we're hoping that this year it can also be tomatoes at a high level. Can you explain your, like we learned how to plant it. All right, okay, well we have a, we use a no-till planter. We, we didn't, we're not planting in the moist year, pulling up a, a, what do you call it behind there, a cap. We don't do that kind of stuff. We're just putting it with a, a single disc opener, double disc opener. We have residue managers that push the residue in front of the planter chute. And then we have special closing wheel attachments to be put on aftermarket on the John Deere no-till planter. So it, what I mean by is, is the timing of planting, the care and attention to detail on that planting date, we have to, you know, we're like you, we have to get down on our hands and knees and look to see where the seed is going and how uniform the depth is and all that stuff. We were sloppy and we didn't, we didn't have the technique early on, but we have that now and we're not failing. Plus we've had good advice from a lot of people that have helped us who have experience in other areas. So I, I admit, lots of problems up front, but it's doable for those crops that I mentioned. It's hard, all right, when you try to emulate those natural system principles, get residue out there. I mean, this is, you know, this is a cover crop in the winter. I don't know what, you know, this could have been January or something. What is the goal? Add more cover, add more carbon, add more organic matter to the system. That's what we're doing. So it, it was a very deliberate and probably in your perspective, extreme effort that we've tried to pursue all these years. But I want to share with you what we've come up with. Here. All right, and look, this is it. Year in, year out. This is just this from this first year I said we, we put in a cover crop and we irrigated. Look, we got you know five, four tons of dry matter. This is just dry organic matter going back into the soil. In 2007, it didn't rain, so we got 27 pounds of carbon organic matter going into the soil because it was a dry year. Okay? Later on, we started kind of rethinking this and we're irrigating maybe two to four inches in the fall to get the cover drop going. But overall, we've added 35, 34 tons of dry matter into the soil, not through compost, but just capturing sunlight energy in the winter and adding it to the system for about 13 and a half tons of carbon. So we've changed the input dynamics of the farm system now pretty substantially. And I'll just show you what, what this looks like now. Sorry about that. Here, and you can come up or you can you can watch this here with your seats here, but here are the standard till things. I just picked these up yesterday. These are the same soil, same field. These are the ones that have been disked and prepped and bed shaped for 19 years in this study compared to the, the no-till cover crop thing. You can see lots and lots more residue. If you were to look carefully, you know, look at this. I mean, those holes here, those are wormholes, all right? I mean, it's, you can, if they're not too heavy, you're welcome to, or we can put them out there, here. But I don't, I don't want to make it too much of a deal, because you've seen the soil like this before. But let me, thank you, Marsha, that's very kind here. But the, it might be too awkward to pass it, but just. So, there are visual differences here, and I don't want to, you know, part of our job for the Land Grant University is to do science to do experiments and monitor and, and, and measure things. So we have measured differences in the field. Uh, in fact, that's part of the work that Jeff is doing for his PhD work here, is to use Gary and Marie's field and our five-point study to see why, if and to what extent things change. So we have seen changes in a number of soil physical properties, including infiltration and aggregation. I don't, I'm just, I'm just talking this through to you right here, but the water goes in the soil much easier in this, in this system here than it does over here. We know that without any, any hesitation. The aggregation is, is higher here. There are a number of biological properties, including bacteria, fungi, and nematodes that have changed in these soils. There's a lot more activity and diversity of soil biology in these soils that has been measured by our colleagues in soil biology. All right, let me just show you. This is where, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion here. I took yesterday, to make this fair, I took clods from the, the 
disc soil and from the no-till soil. And these ones here are not only similar size, but are, they've also been dried in a microwave oven this morning before I came. out of our four systems. So there's nothing holding that one together. Okay, so this one, we're all, it's, it's disintegrating, obviously, all right? It's not, it's not taking water. This one is chunking apart to some extent. In a few minutes, probably this one will be gone by experience. I, I can do this, I don't even bat an eye anymore that this is gonna work. I've never been, in, I don't wanna say embarrassed, but it works time and time again. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt about this, okay? All right, not, let me ask you, what's the reason? How in the world does this happen? They're the same soil texture, the same soil type in terms of characterization of initial properties. We just manage them differently. So what, what's the reason? That, that's my first question to you. Content or biological activity. Okay, what is it doing though? What, tell me what it's doing. Binding. You're right, all right, very good job. Right? So it's an obvious answer here, very nice job. Thank you for being so clear. Well, I don't Probably, I don't know, no, but you're right. Probably, you know, <laughs> when those organisms die, their bodies disintegrate, stuff oozes out, all right, poop or body parts and everything, it, it seals the soil together. Probably, you're absolutely right, I would think that's happening. This one, by the way, is going pretty fast right now, okay? All right, does this matter? This is, does this relate to your management of your farm soils and the functions that you want to achieve in your soil? How does this, what does this say to you? Better water holding capacity? Which one? The minimal till looks like it. It, it, it might, but this is a nice thing. I won't go into this, but I, I, we're, we actually have some folks from UC Merced that are helping to determine that. We don't know that yet, but they're actually doing those kind of measurements water holding capacity. I, I, I think you're right that probably the literature would say that it is going to improve, yeah. If um, they're binded better, you're not losing to air erosion or water erosion, it's not just washing away. Yeah, no, I mean, so they, this, not only is this one disintegrating and perhaps resulting in a crust or a seal, but you know, it's, it's, this stuff is going downstream too, not that, you, yeah. you know, most of you are keeping your water on the field there, but that's not a problem necessarily, but yeah, I mean, Sediment load off stream is, is probably an issue here. So I think, you know, this makes the case here. Now, oh, I almost forgot. Qu qu question. Activity. Yes. So here, so on your left there, the soil in the center of the clod, is it getting moisture? Yeah, that's, all right, so now, this is something, uh, th th that's a very good question, and then somebody else was asking about that over here. Let's imagine we had, and I don't have this right now, but it, let's say we put, water, uh, like a rainfall, you know, sprinkler thing over these two trays here, all right? And what people do when they do this kind of a demo on a field day like this in the Midwest, they'll have a rainfall simulator because they get rain and we don't get rain in the summertime, but it shows. And then they collect, they have the holes in the, in the containers here and they collect the amount of drainage water that comes out. And then what, an interesting thing they do that is very revealing is that they will then turn, not only will this one have a lot of runoff that we've sort of imagined seeing here, but this one will be dry underneath the, the top surface inch there. And then they'll flip these trays over, and I, I can't do this here, we, don't, we didn't do the setup here, but this one will be wet throughout, and this one will be dry <coughs> below the surface. So it, it does affect infiltration, and I, I, you know, some of you know, and Dan Monk certainly knows this, I happen to believe that there is value that is not being recognized by overhead center pivot irrigation here in California. I'll just say that as a personal opinion, all right? And you can say there are lots of different reasons historically why farmers have not 
adopted or adopted center pivot irrigation, and some of them might be right. Historically, they got stuck or they didn't have enough water supplied with the nozzling to get around to meet ET demands. A lot of that, I think, has been overcome. But some other problems are infiltration. People claim that on those outer spans of a pivot where the water is just gushing out because the pivot's moving faster, their soils don't take their wa the water and they get water ponding and sealing and running off. I don't think you'd have that problem if you were doing this. So your water holding capacity would be a lot more there than here. I don't, again, that's what I have to be careful. We don't know that for sure yet, but I think that's probably true. We, we do know infiltration rates are a lot higher, right? And you can yeah, just look at that soil. It's no. ma you know, macro pores move water. So oh. the fact that we've got a lot of macro pores, you can see that. We can. Uh, Jeff, yeah. talk about your, your, your experiments and some of the things. Yeah, what so, are you so measuring? We've started to do some infiltration uh, measurements, you know, where we put the first inch, the second inch, the third inch, the fourth inch of water, and, and it's, it's pretty dramatic. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the, the I mean, we're, 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 we're not, we haven't, you know, done statistics on all this data yet. It's initial, but it's, so, it's pretty but, dramatic. All right, but listen, the, the, the only hang up here, and let's be all honest here, when is this going to ha help you as farmers? The only time I can see is when winter rains come. All right? It, it, it is, uh, or, or if you're flood irrigating. Maybe. Well, if you're furrowed surface irrigating, but it, most people probably aren't doing surface irrigation too much more. So, if, you know, you, you get seven inches of rain, can this infiltrate better? And is that going to amount to anything functionally, you know, economically valuable? I don't know that. But water movement, and this is where Dan has.